Tennessee Civil War 150 is brought to you in part by Tennessee Department of Education, Tennessee Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission, and Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area. The vast majority of Americans in the first half of the 19th century were highly religious and overwhelmingly Christian. They believed America was destined for greatness in part because of our belief in God. We were a favored people. This conviction was particularly strong in the heavily Protestant South. The belief among Southerners that they were ordained for greatness by God was put to the ultimate test by the war. In a nation full of professing religious believers, could faith stand the test of the war? The Civil War was not only a crisis of country and conscience, but also a crisis of faith. Brothers and sisters, there is but one answer. In the rush to build an identity for the newly formed nation, religious leaders saw a golden opportunity to evangelize and build a flock of strong believers who in their minds tied the future success of the United States with the strength of their religious convictions. By the turn of the 19th century, with a second great awakening, a second revival movement that lasts over the first couple of decades of the 19th, a century, uh, orthodoxy or, or dogma uh, receded in the face of the importance of revelation. And one of the things about revelation that's injurious to dogma is that revelation to, can come to almost anybody, not only established clergy trained in college and seminary, but it can also come to women, to African Americans, to the unlettered, to those persons of, of the lower classes. In large measure, it helps to spearhead the rapid growth of the Baptist and a newer group called the Methodists and others uh, who spread like wildfire across the United States, north and south, east and west. Approximately 40% of the population could be identified as evangelical Christians and many more were religious believers. As with any movement that inspires large-scale and fervent devotion, there were naturally disagreements. And when disagreements occur over the values that individuals hold most dear, those differences of opinion can be passionate and unyielding. Long before the first shots were fired over Fort Sumter in April of 1861, the divisions in our nation could be seen most readily in our churches. Of the many divisive issues at hand, slavery proved to be the most caustic. The major arguments over slavery started in the Revolution. The American Revolution did not solve the slavery problem, but it made slavery a problem like it had not been before. The rhetoric for freedom, the idea that all are created equal uh, with certain inalienable rights. Thomas Jefferson penned those words. Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder. So he didn't see those words as freeing the slaves, as, as words that would command that the slaves be free. At the same time, once those words are out there, and once freedom is out there, and the idea that you can rebel against authority if you are in the right, and that you should rebel against authority if you are in the right, that idea of liberty expanded beyond all control. Those who believed slavery was supported by the Bible had mountains of scripture on their side. Those who opposed slavery on the basis of Judeo-Christian religion had an uphill battle. 
the abolitionists were forced to argue a more nuanced position based on critical biblical interpretation and an appeal to the overall character of the book's teachings. The theological dif difficulty with slavery was the clear testimony of the scriptures that in both the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, the defining figures of the Christian faith had not objected to slavery. In the Old Testament, it was obvious that uh, Abraham had owned slaves. It was obvious that the Mosaic legislation that provided for Israel had many provisions concerning the enslavement of those who were defeated in battle by the, the Israelites. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. The Confederacy believed that the Bible never condemned slavery, that in fact there was slavery all throughout the scripture, and there was never any explicit condemnation of the practice. So there was obviously no condemnation for the Confederacy and its version and its understanding of its democratic rights. And the most extreme people like William Lloyd Garrison were on record, published in his own newspaper, The Liberator, saying that if a good case could be made in scripture to support slavery, then to hell with the Bible. Most abolitionists were much more cautious because they realized the almost universal credence, the universal respect given to the scriptures in the United States at this time. Presbyterian minister Henry Van Dyke issued a strong rebuke to anyone who tried to advance this position. The tree of abolitionism is evil and only evil. Root, branch, flower, and leaf, and fruit that it springs from and is nurtured by an utter rejection of the scriptures. In the New Testament, it was uh, very significant in the minds of those who defended slavery that while Jesus uh, condemned, in effect, polygamy and in effect condemned some of the other conditions that Israel had maintained in the pre-Christian era, Jesus himself in the Gospels never condemned slavery. And then there's the uh, testimony of the Apostle Paul who in the book of Philemon sent a, an escaped slave, Onesimus, back to his owner Philemon and in effect uh, requested Philemon to be kind to his slave but did not urge him to end the slave relationship. And there were several passages in the Pauline epistles where the Apostle Paul counseled those who were slaves to, to bear with their servitude as an example of what Christian living should be. Afraid of alienating moderates with emancipationist tendencies, the abolitionists turned instead to other methods to combat the overwhelming wave of biblical support for slavery. Moral reasoning and Jesus' command to love one another unconditionally became the preferred position. Perhaps famed abolitionist Henry Ward Beecher best explained the stance. I came to open the prison doors, said Christ, and that is the text on which men justify shutting them and locking them. I came to loose those that are bound, and that is the text out of which men spin cords to bind them, women and children. I came to carry light to them that are in darkness and deliverance to the oppressed, and that is the book from out of which they argue, with amazing ingenuity, all the infernal meshes and snares by which to keep men in bondage, it is pitiful. For African Americans suffused throughout African American religion, long before the Civil War broke out, was this idea that God would eventually, in God's time, deliver these captive peoples. And the identification between African Americans, their identification with the, the saga of the ancient Hebrews, gave them the hope that the same deliverance that had come to the children of Israel would also come to African Americans. Religion was a problem for slaveholders because if their slaves became Christian, then their slaves would be more like 
them. And if their slaves were more like them, then it would be more difficult to treat them like slaves. So Christianity carried with it a certain understanding of civilization. In 1844, the General Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church was at an impasse over the institution of slavery. Southern Methodists believed the institution to be integral to their society and way of life. Northerners saw slavery as a terrible evil inconsistent with the values of Christianity. This difference of opinion came to a head when Northern delegates to the 1844 General Conference asked Bishop James Osgood Andrew of Georgia to step down from his position as long as he owned slaves. Bishop Andrew refused, and when the resolution was put to a vote, it was approved, 110 to 68, strictly along geographic lines. Thus, the Methodist Episcopal Church South was born. And so it was with the Baptist. Though they maintained a stated policy of neutrality regarding slavery, many Southern Baptists believed that their Northern brethren were secretly harboring abolitionist tendencies. In 1845, the Georgia State Convention decided to test this theory by appointing slaveholder James E. Reeve to the Baptist Home Mission Society. Not wanting to change their neutral position on slavery, the Home Mission Society rejected Mr. Reeves' candidacy. The Southern Baptists saw this as an outright attack on their way of life, and nine Southern states broke from the national organization to form the Southern Baptist Convention. The nation's other large Protestant denomination, the Presbyterians, split along the pro-slavery and abolitionist lines as well, culminating in the division into the old and new schools in 1857. You're seeing a splitting in the country, um, the, a splitting of the country's psyche, a splitting of the country's emotional components, a splitting of the country's practical and social components, and the chasm is just widening, and what the politicians are doing and to be very honest, fueled by the pulpit is the continued split because it doesn't matter whether you are from Texas, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, or Ohio, your influence were those people around you and your church. And if your church was preaching the component of slavery, let's say, but also preaching against the invasion that was coming and the omnipresent power of the federal government, the overreach of the federal government, but if your church is preaching secession as immoral, slavery is, is immoral, the union must be preserved. It's all being fueled out of several different places and if people believe a certain way, they can be led to believe that way in even more strident ways. People don't usually go the other direction. When the split does come, for example, in a church, um, it becomes very personal. And I think that's a microcosm of what the country was going through. You were seeing families split apart, states split apart. Um, and it's all that great American tragedy. Near the cross, my tortured soul, aching as you Second only to slavery in the minds of believers during the Civil War was the role of providence, the belief in God's intervention in worldly affairs. Believers on both sides were firmly convinced that they could understand God's intentions for this world, and more importantly, that God was squarely on their side during this contest. When the Confederate States of America came into existence, most of the uh, official documents bringing the Confederacy into life imitated quite closely the Constitution of the United States and other important documents that had gone into making up U.S. history. The one very large exception was the explicit uh, insertion into the preface of the Confederate Constitution of their belief in God and in the rule of God o over the nations. And this was thought by many in, in the North as well as in the South to have taken the proper step 
to acknowledge the providence of God as the controlling destiny of, of the nation. And this was another way in which uh, Confederates who wanted to defend their way of life as a biblical way of life thought that they had the advantage over Northerners. The Confederacy from its inception sets itself up as a Christian nation. They're definitely not looking to set up a wall of separation between church and state. And you, the Confederate Constitution says it is invoking the favor and guidance of Almighty God. In the early 1860s, there were many Southern sermons preached about the Exodus, with Pharaoh now being Abraham Lincoln in the North, and the people of Israel seeking freedom now being the Confederate States that wanted to leave the Union. The role of God was so central to the formation of the new government and their cause that they made it a permanent part of their most important symbol. When the Confederate States of America adopted their great seal, the motto on the seal was Dio Vindice, God will vindicate, indicating that they strongly believed he was on their side and that they would be victorious. The horrors of war and the unspeakable barbarity of it turned a lot of people towards having a stronger faith. During the Civil War, both sides experienced revivals within the camps. The chaplains and religious leaders and even some of their generals, like General Quintard and General Polk, helped lead their soldiers to finding a calmer faith to get them through the trials of war. General Leonidas Polk, known as the Fighting Bishop, was a strong Christian voice as well. Polk graduated from West Point with Jefferson Davis before going on to become the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Louisiana. Polk hoped for peaceful secession, but when hostilities began, he, as he put it, buckled the sword over the gown. Like David and Moses before him, Polk saw armed struggle as his duty to God. Perhaps the most famous among these Confederate Christians was General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson. Jackson was an Old Testament warrior. There was a harshness and almost at times a cruelty, um, not even just toward the enemy, but toward his own men, driving them relentlessly because um, this was just flesh and it was expendable to achieve the ends desired. This was not someone who, it was his hope, I think, that God was on his side, but that God was on his side. He is someone who can go out on a field and, and just pray with bullets flying around him and have no fear at all because he believes that he is as safe on a battlefield as he is in his bed at home because everything is in God's control and when God gets ready to take him, he will take him. There's a great moment as the story goes after the Battle of Fredericksburg when Lee's army has delivered a crushing blow to the Army of the Potomac and a staff officer asks, Stonewall Jackson, what shall we do? And Jackson says, kill them, kill them all. It's not the kind of person you want to meet on the battlefield because he's gonna put all the cards on the table to win. Death, you know, it's often death that really turns the hearts and the souls of these men to things eternal. One passage that I talk about in my book of where a man who had just been converted was killed. And the men who are watching this event, they, they see this soldier being struck by a bullet and they watch him drop his gun and clap his hands and say, bless the Lord, just seconds before he dies. And this has an enormous impact on the soldiers because they see this and they recognize how quickly death can come and yet how he, he could leave this life happy because of that conversion. And so you see people really wanting to be converted the more the war goes on. There's a Massachusetts soldier writing in the summer of 1864 who writes home to his mother and he's telling her that I hope you shall never see the sights that I have seen. Every day has become a walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you can see in that someone who clearly understands the Word of God, but it's hard to understand exactly what he was thinking at that moment. Was it, you know, his faith being shaken? I don't know. I think what he's doing is he's, he's pressing that issue that this is, our, this is our trial. One of the important findings of recent scholarship on religion in the Civil War is how much the home front encouraged uh, Christian life amongst the soldiers. Interestingly, 
most of that uh, encouragement, most of the, what was talked about uh, uh, concerning religion in the letters, did not have to do with the victory of the North, the victory of the South, the grand level political scheme. Most was direct spiritual encouragement, uh, urging the troops to remain faithful to their spouses, to avoid gambling, prostitution, dissipation, a lot of letters about the dangers of card playing, and positively to urge the soldiers to read their Bibles, to attend chapel services, to re respect God, because in this age, everyone knew that the life of the soldier was very dangerous, particularly on the battlefield, but even more so through disease and death when someone was injured in the field of, of battle. Seeing the great suffering, seeing your friends killed beside you also caused some to question their faith. And there were great trials and periods of deep questioning that the Civil War brought about among the troops on both sides. Church leaders reacted by entreating their congregants to increase their faith rather than allow it to wane. Sin was seen as the enemy just as much as the Army of the North. Clergy believe that early victories led to overconfidence that was easily shaken by later defeats. Military losses were blamed on lack of faith, and days of fasting to pray and cleanse were commanded. It was devastating when the war didn't go their way. I mean, it, it, they had to rethink uh, all that they had bought, you know, theologically. I mean, you know, the, the lost cause has been used to identify what they were going through. So it was devastating for them in the South, religiously, theologically devastating. But why would God abandon them? Did God abandon them? Or was this somehow God's way of disciplining them, trying to tell them something about their own sin? You know, because just because you lose doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Many times it means God does love you. God is trying to discipline you. So all throughout Scripture, there are cases in which God's chosen people are defeated by foreign powers as God's way of chastising them. For many years following the war, Southern Christians continued to struggle with their belief that God had blessed the institution of slavery and had anointed his followers with the gift to understand providence. Those tenets had been central to their theology before the war, and both were almost completely destroyed in the wake of Union victory. Images of the dead lying on battlefields remain some of the most powerful and enduring. Piles of bodies and body parts had desensitized many to death during the war. By caring for their fallen comrades, Soldiers and civilians began to use burial rituals as a way to reclaim their humanity. This continued after the war as massive efforts were made to find fallen family members from both sides. The shared experience of losing over 2% of the nation's population united believers in their suffering. In spite of their differences over the many causes of the war, all experienced death, and dealing with that death was one of the first steps in the healing of the nation. I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of the religious history of the war that Southern defeat seemed to have stabilized and cemented Southern confidence in God more than was the case in the North. Immediately after the war, Northern ministers praised the providence of God that had brought about the, the Northern victory, but that sentiment uh, eased, faded away fairly rapidly in the uh, turn of the North to industrial expansion, to the incorporation of the North with great new waves of, of immigrants from Europe. In the South, it was different. The, the uh, belief that God had a reason for the defeat grew uh, rapidly. The, the notion that uh, the Southern way of life could still be preserved under God, even though the South had been incorporated back into the Union, became a very strong belief. African American churches played a central role in rebuilding their communities as well. In 1870, a delegation of black church leaders met in Jackson, Tennessee to officially form the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church as an African American offshoot of the Methodist Episcopal Church South. 
Other African-American churches were also spreading in the South. Very successful. Um, Northern Black Baptists came, South, Northern member, ministers and members of the AME Church, Northern members and members of the AME Zion Church, Presbyterian Church and Methodist Episcopal Church North all came South. And, um, and black churches were, were sprung up everywhere uh, throughout the South. And by the 1880s, by the, by the, really by the 1890s, by 1900, uh, all of these were mature, functioning religious bodies with enormous exercise and enormous influence uh, within those parts of the, of the South where they uh, had experienced rapid growth. The church really becomes the place after the war where people can go to and sort of reestablish communities, reestablish connections. And so the church really grows. You don't find people abandoning their faith. Uh, there's much more of a belief of if something went wrong, I'm blaming the human aspect of it and not leaving their faith. But the church becomes very important afterwards as far as bringing back people, bringing back connections. One of the lasting effects of the war among many veterans was a questioning of their own faith. Many of the churches had struggled with this before the war. The Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians had all argued amongst themselves over the institution of slavery and had divided prior to the war. The Methodists were the first to get over that. In 1939, they came back together. The Presbyterians did so in 1983. But even to this day, the Civil War has had a lingering effect nationally. The Baptists have never come back together. Religion can't be separated from the Civil War in large measure because religion in general can't be separated from the overall American experience. The Civil War, which constituted perhaps the, the greatest crisis ever to envelop American society, was fraught with religious symbolism and religious imagery and uh, had a tremendous effect on the lived religion on persons in both the North and the South, on persons both black and white. Years after the war, Lieutenant General Alexander Stewart reflected on the conflict, writing, I do not know who was finally right or wrong on the last war. I do not even know whose side God was on. I do believe that in the end, God had need of the United States of America. Tennessee Civil War 150 is brought to you in part by Tennessee Department of Education, Tennessee Civil War Sesquicentennial Commission, and Tennessee Civil War National Heritage Area.